Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. And I'd like now like to call to order this meeting of the Human Resources Governance and Stakeholder Relations Committee of Waterfront Toronto. And I've been advised that a quorum is present, so it's appropriate to proceed. So welcome to all of you who are joining today. We appreciate your interest and participation. And I'd also like to remind you that the open session of today's meeting is being recorded and will be posted for the public to view. I'd also ask that people please keep their microphones and cameras off unless they wish to speak. Um, thank you very much. So I think we'll move to uh, approve the meeting agenda. And the first item uh, is to seek approval to address items six and seven. I, I understand that we're going to address those items first before we discuss the governance documents. And uh, I, I understand that Steve will be joining us about 9.30 and then as well, Barry Ryder from Bennett Jones. Is that correct, Ian? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay, great. So may I please have a motion to approve the agenda for the meeting? So moved. Thank you. And I think I may have to second. Is that true? Yes. Yes. That's okay. <laughs> um, oh, I should also note that that Joe Cressy was unavailable to join us today, Andrew. So you'll be doing a lot of moving. So thank yeah. you. Wendy, why don't we, for the record, uh, and maybe uh, Ina or Ian can uh, counsel us on this, but should we assume that I'm moving everything and you're second everything to yes. uh, remove the perfunctory? Uh... Okay, good. Thank yes, you. Note that. Thanks for that, Andrew. Okay, uh, any uh, declaration uh, conflict of interest? None. None declared. Okay, um, so now we can move on to the business of the meeting and address the consent agenda, the draft minutes of the open session. Um, can we have approval of the minutes of the open session of November 12th? May I please have a motion to approve? Approved. So moved. And I will second. All, any discussion? All in favor? Contrary minded? Okay, so approved. Um, we're going to whip through this, as you can tell. Okay, so now we're on governance document review, and we will put that off for now, and we will address items six and seven. So six, we are going to have a human resources update um, and address uh, first from Rose on diversity and inclusion, um, and then the MNP audit on resource and succession planning um, from Lisa. So, Rose, um, can you please uh, give us an update, you and George, on human resources? Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I'll take the HR report as read. However, I really would like to highlight some of the efforts we've made since our last meeting in November. Under the DEI area, as you may know, WT and representatives from the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations have selected our first Indigenous design expert to join our DRP panel. And that was Matthew Hickey. He joined our DRP on January 27th. <clears throat> Matthew is Mohawk from the Six Nations of the Grand Reserve, River Reserve, and is a partner at an architect firm with 14 years of Indigenous design experience, is also an instructor and a board member of Artscape Toronto. We are going to be inviting Matthew to join us at a staff town hall to speak to us about some of his experiences that can help us to continue to explore opportunities to foster positive working relations, relationships with Indigenous peoples. Our staff at Waterfront Toronto, our board members and DRP members, completed the first part of Indigenous cultural safety training. At our next upcoming town hall, we will be discussing our learnings from our training and continue the discussion on how we can prioritize our cultural awareness, not only in the workplace, but in our everyday lives. Also, as a continuation of that learning and to be part of the social change needed to reconcile and reform our relationships with Indigenous people, we have started the process to provide our Waterfront Toronto staff, our board members and DRP members, additional training, which is from bystander to ally. A date for this is still to be determined given all the other work priorities in the months ahead. Under creating an inclusive workforce area, I'm happy to say <clears throat> that our small but mighty HR team have joined our agency members in a government community of practice 
where we have opportunities to discuss and share ideas and information on DE&I matters. We meet at least every second month or as required and have many email exchanges when canvassing for information. Some of our other agency members that are part of this community of practice are from IO, LCBO, AGCO, OCS, OPG, WSIB, OLG, and of course our partners with the OPS. For example, <clears throat> Kaylee and I learned a great deal from our first meeting. We learned about different job posting boards, websites and ex that expands our reach for our, for our recruitment efforts to ensure we are communicating to all diverse candidates. We're also still researching training for our staff that focuses on unconscious bias and removing racism, not only in the workplace, but in our everyday lives. And finally, an RFP in our, is in progress to hire an external DNI consultant to assist our HR and management team to design, develop, and implement programs and strategies intended to promote equity and inclusion, encourage diversity, and stamp out any racism. This RFP is going to be issued in the upcoming weeks. I'll now hand it over to Cameron, who'll talk to us about the efforts we've made around Black History Month in February. Well, I, thanks, Rose. I just wanted to um, let the committee know, uh, and Steve mentioned this, by the way, at the last uh, board meeting, we um, commemorated Black History Month, which was um, February in three ways. Um, the first was a long form blog, which we wrote on um, uh, Lucy and uh, Thornton Blackburn, the, the the fugitive slaves who founded the first uh, cab. Sorry, I'm getting a bit of feedback. Cab company in Toronto. Um, we also produced a three-part video series uh, with our artists and residents, which um, were are the Black uh, Speculative Arts Movement um, on Afrofuturism, and we really made a concerted effort to um, uh, use our social channels. And by the way, we're going to talk about this in the, the next item. Um, uh, to promote a, a number of other initiatives that Waterfront, um, uh, other agencies on the Waterfront uh, were undertaking, like Bayside Gallery. Um, they had an exhibit on, I think, in Black. So it was, it was quite successful. In fact, our numbers indicate that that the uh, performance of, of most of our content was uh, at about the same um, as we received for the Bridge Watch campaign, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that in the, in the next item. But uh, we just wanted to let um, folks know we'll of course make a, an effort to repeat this uh, uh, next year and this month by the way is engineering and water month so that's the theme for, for this month and we are developing content uh, around that as well so that's all I wanted to say. Okay thank you very much good work Rose and uh, and very much uh, appreciate your update as well Cameron. Um, so, Lisa, can we hear from you on the planned audit for the resource and succession planning by yes. our internal auditors? Thank you. Absolutely, Wendy. Good morning, everyone. So, while the Corporations Finance Audit and Risk Management Committee is responsible for overall oversight of Waterfront's uh, internal audit function, we are bringing this particular area of scope to this committee because it has an, a human resources uh, component and focus to it. So the resource and succession planning review is the second of six audits that are included in our three-year internal audit plan, and we're currently in the first year of that plan. Uh, our risk-based internal audit plan was approved by our farm committee last February and is carried out by an, our internal audit firm, MNP. We took a different, slightly different approach with respect to this resource succession plan um, review, which is worth noting, and that is it's it's forward looking in nature as opposed to a traditional backward looking compliance audit and in particular it's focused on making sure that we have the right resources and skill sets to deliver on the projects that are outlined in our strategic plan and some of the key areas of focus um, in this review will include the development of a skills matrix for our organization to identify an inventory of, of skills that we currently have as well as identifying any skills gaps that we need to fill. It'll also focus on um, how we can better mitigate in times of staff absence and departure. And it will also focus on opportunities for career development and talent management for our staff. So really enhancing succession planning and employee retention. And this is really in light of the fact that we are a smaller organization 
and it's not always possible for staff to move to more senior positions unless someone leaves. So we're really looking at how we can enhance that and through learning and development, career development, and also um, at the farm committee, we talked about secondments. Patrick raised a great idea about secondments. Um, in, in addition, we're also looking at opportunities to enhance employee engagement in a, in a virtual setting. And then finally, we're taking the opportunity through this resource and succession planning review to look at it with a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens, recognizing that we are at an early stage of developing a strategy on DE&I, and really looking at how this strategy can best be informed by this review. And so the work for the review will take place over the next four months, and we'll report back to both the Farm Committee and this committee in September. And I'd be happy to take any questions, and I know Patrick's here as well at this committee meeting. He was at the farm committee where we discussed it. Lisa, I have a question. Yeah. Um, do do uh, do you have a way to record and um, and uh, and just evaluate uh, which staff members are engaged in external activities on advisory boards or volunteering or being proactive in the community? I just think that's such an important component. Is there a way to, to just capture that, not to make it mandatory, but to understand who is out there doing, you know, on, involved in various committees and, and being proactive? Because so many of the staff are, I understand. Yeah, and that's a great question and great point, Wendy. I know, I know through communications, through Cameron's team, um, we do um, keep track of a lot of those activities. And I know George has got his hand up, so I'll, I'll stop and let him speak. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, Wendy, that's a great uh, uh, suggestion. We we did actually look at that. We're working to actually put a bit of that matrix together, not just in terms of their skills at work, but their skills and interests outside of work. Um, so, for example, without getting into the details, we were looking at something that would uh, help uh, be a catalyst on one of the properties, and we were trying to find background. And as it turns out, a couple of our staff have happen to be experts in this area in their own personal interests. Um, so, you know, that's suggested to us. We need to broaden our scope around the professional skills in the workplace to other things that they're doing outside of the workplace that we could draw on. Um, so we're starting to look at that as well. And just to, to, to add to that, George and Wendy, we are actually going to be implementing a human resources module to our enterprise planning resources or our enterprise resource planning system, our ERP system, which has a talent management module in it out of the box and is allows us to effectively, you know, record um, and track that those skills and those outside areas that are involved and employees are involved in. So it will help support that initiative. Very good. And do we have any questions for Lisa? If I may, Chair. Yes, please go ahead, Patrick. Um, I mean, the, the, maybe one element where uh, I would suggest there could be a little bit more um, research done would be mentoring. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly, I've seen that work mm -hmm. in certain industries where, um, you know, selectively that it, 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 it's done. Um, and I think it speaks to uh, the chair's point on, um, you know, knowing people's background also that can that can also uh, lure out some good things and that the only other um i just wanted to make the committee aware that io will have a new head of uh, of inclusion equity and diversity uh, as of the end of march that's going to be a new position so um just wanted to uh, point that out and hopefully that can be also a useful uh, resource thank you Thanks, that's patrick. very helpful thank you patrick And do we have any other questions? Well, I mean, maybe if I can just add to yeah. uh, what Rose shared with you. Um, and Patrick, that's really good for us to know. Uh, and we're working with IO. And as Rose pointed out, we're going to be also adding to our HR uh, support with uh, somebody who will be leading this, uh, this file for us as well. So that will be in our plans as well. So it would be great to see how IO uh, proceeded. Um, as as uh, Rose identified, we are looking at the second round, building on the first 
round of training. Um, Charmaine, my uh, executive assistant, and I have actually done the second round of training, uh, which is really uh, to become an ally. And it really focuses on two things. First of all, understanding uh, the white privilege that we do, uh, many of us, uh, benefit from and how that could bias some of our, our views on issues. But one of the great tools that it does give you, and it gives you a number, a number of scenarios, is how to intervene when you do see prejudicial actions. And uh, I think that's a, it certainly was a great eye-opening experience on the different tools available, um, depending on the audience. And I, I think that's definitely something Rose and I are looking at, but also looking at other training uh, modules that we could actually apply. The only other thing I would add, well, two things maybe, um, we have also included uh, diversity in the succession planning and the performance contracts of our uh, senior management team, because that's probably where we have the least diversity, but at least we're now starting to look at a broader pool. So when uh, the opportunity arises to, uh, to replace somebody who leaves, uh, that we've already engaged in making sure we have as broad and skillful pool as possible to draw on. And the audit, uh, the skills audit that Lisa uh, identified, I think would be very helpful. Uh, the other thing that we are grappling with, and this is a bit on, on the mentoring side as well, is we have a very small and flat organization. So that has challenges both uh, with regards to opportunities for advancement, but also with regards to mentoring. So we are looking at, and as you identified earlier, so comments are a great opportunity, but also informal mentoring uh, with other experts, not just in our organization, but in other organizations. So I think all the suggestions that have been shared are all good ones, and we're just trying to uh, phase them in uh, appropriately over the coming year. Very good. Yeah, I think I think all of these sort of volunteering and advisory and mentoring and professional development and training is it's just essential, especially with um, such a, you know, a, a, a complex organization. And also, as you say, George, it's, it's not an organization uh, that can scale up from where we are right now at, at this particular time anyway. So it's really important. And, and also great representation when people are out in the community as well. So that's very helpful. Okay, so do we have any further questions for Lisa? Okay, so then let's move on to the stakeholder item number seven, the stakeholder relationship plan. And um, at the last meeting, we received, <clears throat> excuse me, a presentation on some of the plans um, from Cameron. And so today he's going to give us an update and take us through more information. Cameron? Thanks, Madam Chair. I just wanted to update the committee. We, uh, when we met in November, uh, we unpacked um, and discussed uh, the, the need for um, a, a broader sort of stakeholder engagement tool um, that would allow us to um, have a standing, I call it a standing focus group. That may not be the most precise term, but that's conceptually what it would be like uh, that we can um, survey up to four times a year um, on broader issues, um, societal issues around our purpose and our mission and our mandate. And if you think about the corporation sort of gestation, when the corporation was created almost 20 years ago, it had a very wide aperture because it was blue skying. And over the last probably uh, seven or eight years, as projects have formed, we've, we've engaged with stakeholders on project specific items uh, that are quite um, granular. You know, again, I, where does the bench go and should the should this go here or that? There, but we we didn't we've we've not been able to have sort of the broader soundings on what is the purpose of this corporation from a broader societal perspective, and so this is the undertaking that will help us get that kind of uh, those viewpoints um, in a fairly efficient way that we that we can um, that we can engage with. So this is all to say that we have written up uh, an rfp for uh, the vendor community this is a, a an established uh, 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 package or established uh, suite uh, for for market research now so there's a there's a there's a there are tools that uh, market researchers use becoming more common um, and we are in market right now with the rfp and it will close on the 12th of this month of march 
so in a few days and we expect to have the vendor up and engaged um, by April and we will then be in a position to have our first um, survey they'll the first order of business will be recruit the population or the sample I should say and that likely will be demographic and psychographic that they'll, they'll choose from but we'll rely on that vendor to give us the best advice on how to do that the size and and the representation and then we will be able to uh, engage and use that that standing focus group if you will uh, by May or June And that, that's okay. uh, are there any questions for Cameron? I, I did have a quick question. Um, not being in that uh, business, just a reputational uh, group that we were going to be hiring, which I guess the RF, uh, the RFP is going to be out, uh, and some later documentation. But uh, what does, uh, how does that inform this this group? What can you just go through a little bit how how the two work together? Well, I think we would, Patrick, identify a kind of a, a, a schedule of, of research with this group um, on the sort of thorny reputational issues that we are confronting um, and bring that forward to the committee and have a structured, um, you know, a, a structured uh, research um, effort throughout the year. So if we were to do quarterly, I'm not not convinced we need to do quarterly maybe we do what three three a year we could say okay in august we're going to be doing we're going to be testing out should we be doing more in terms of our esg or what does the community think about you know the role of technology and urbanism whatever those those issues are so we would look at our mandate because we do have a broad mandate and so we do have to get focused on and and make sure that what we're delivering matters to people um and so we would use those we would use the that panel uh, that standing focus group to um, to ping and to 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 give us a, a sense of yeah this is right direction this is wrong direction you're probably better at this than that others others are better that you should focus here so it, we would have a we would have a line of sight I think annually into into what we what kinds of questions we need to answer and address in, in order to really improve and build on our on our um, on our reputation with this representative sample. That makes if that makes sense. Thank you. Any further questions for Cameron? Okay, thanks very much, Cameron. And um, Steve has joined us, so that's great. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. And so, Steve, now that you're here, we will go to um, item number four: the governance document review. And we will hear a presentation from our general counsel, Ian Ness, on the government's do governance document review process that the corporation is now undertaking. And we'll be considering recommending approval of six key governance documents. And the draft documents are in the meeting materials that were posted to board effect. So before I turn this over to Ian, I'd just like to make a few remarks. Um, it's important to know that Today is the continuation of a review process that began in 2019. And at that time, we identified the need to update our key governance documents to ensure they reflect best practices in corporate governance and also are aligned with the strategies and directions of the corporation. So there are a total of 14 documents that we're reviewing. And you will recall that in December 2020, the board approved the mandate for the role of the corporate secretary. So today we'll be considering the committee mandates as well as the director code of conduct, the director confidentiality agreement, and the director and officer indemnity agreement. And then the balance of the documents will be considered at our next meeting in the spring. So there's a lot of work that's been done by a number of people um, to guide this process. And I know it's been a challenge to fit this into the board, board schedule, especially with all of the other things going on. However, it's a very important and necessary part of our business to review the governance documents and processes on a periodic basis. So it's our goal to review these documents on an annual basis going forward. Um, and although once we get through this round, I expect any changes will be more um, like fine tuning. So since my appointment as chair of the committee last fall, I've been involved in the document review process 
and have had a number of discussions with senior management and our board chair. And I fully support this effort. And I'd like to thank Ian Ness uh, for his excellent work and perseverance. He's just been outstanding um, right through this process. And with that, I'd like to turn this matter over to Ian. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, Wendy. Um, uh, we are expecting a guest, uh, and he's about to join. Just a minute. Uh, um, Barry, uh, uh, perfect timing. Um, uh, joining, joining us now, just to, uh, I'll walk us through the process in a minute, but uh, just joining us is Barry Ryder, who's the chair of the Corporate Governance and Director of Protection Practice at uh, Bennett Jones who's been uh, advising us over the years in terms of some of our governance issues and has been involved in, in this uh, this process as well. Um, I thought I would just take a couple minutes just just to explain uh, the process we followed and then and then highlight some of the, the areas that uh, we're changing or we're, we're, we've been looking at in terms of the, the six documents that are in front of us today. Um, as Wendy says, the process began in, in 2019. Uh, we realized that that some of the documents hadn't been updated for several years, uh, and they were in need of uh, of updating, and certainly review. Uh, also, our internal auditors, MNP, made suggestions as to some of the things we should be looking and some of the things we, we should be doing. So we we identified 14 documents that should be updated or or created, as the case may be. There's a couple new documents. Um, <clears throat> We met with Barry and, and one of his colleagues uh, to discuss the process, uh, obtained a number of precedents and examples of best practices. Uh, we considered some of the precedents that uh, that that I would say are are in comparable uh, situations, comparable organizations to ourselves. Uh, we spoke to the senior management team at length. Um, last year, we received input from committee chairs i think in some cases they they went so far as to to actually uh, consult with committee members themselves um there was some input we received from directors themselves as, as they were working through the process of their own documents uh and and we tried to bring those together uh, we drafted new versions to reflect all, all the um, comments received, but also to make sure we were reflective and in line with our, our corporate objectives and policies. Um, as I say, we prepared drafts of these documents. Um, Barry and his colleagues uh, took those, uh, reviewed them and revised them, I think safe to say, to ref reflect uh, current best practices, both in terms of, of substance and, and, and formatting and, and method of presentation. Uh, and then we went back to our teams and, and reworked some of the documents, made sure they, again, they were aligned with current thinking. Um, as Wendy says, it spoke to her, uh, worked closely with, with George, um, had some consultation with, with Steve as well. Um, and um, uh, so what what we have in front of us today are is one part of the remaining governance documents. As Wendy says, we uh, approved the uh, mandate for the corporate secretary in December 2020, um, six today, and there'll be another seven um, that we deal with uh, at our next meeting. Um, of the six documents today, let me just deal briefly with them uh, and then we can open up for questions, discussions, um, uh, comments, etc. Um, there's the director's confidentiality agreement. Um, what we've tried to do on that one is try to streamline it. Uh, we've got a bit of a simplified version. We've gotten rid of some of the confusing provisions. Um, there were some comments we received through the process on that that the duplicated things that were in the code of conduct. So we try to streamline that. Um, but it, it, it in essence, is, is a very similar document to what it was before in the, in the sense that directors are given confidentiality, uh, confidential information, and they're intended to uh, require to maintain that confidentiality. With respect to the director's indemnity agreement, um, we want to ensure that we continue to reflect best practice. Um, we wanted it to be as strong as possible, but we also wanted it to be reasonable in the circumstances. Um, 
and uh, Barry and his colleagues were were very helpful in terms of of identifying areas that that we could change and, and should change. Uh, and again, there's also some comments we received from others through the process. Um, we've clarified some of the payment processes relating to advances as well as reimbursement. We've we've talked about um, made specific reference to insurance coverage. Um, we've uh, changed made changes to the settlement provisions to make sure that any settlement doesn't prejudice the rights of an indemnified party. Um, uh, we've um, sort of amplified, if that's the right word, the good faith reliance uh, provisions that were in the indemnity. Um, and uh, so I, I think overall on that one, we, we've we, we've stayed true to the intent of, of the prior form, which was, as I say, to give good protection to directors, uh, but but be a reasonable format. But I think uh, we've uh, we, we've updated it where, where we certainly could. And on the code of conduct, uh, we have uh, revised some of the introdu introductory language so it's consistent with the wording in our act. Um, and you know, a code is is meant to provide examples, but not and, and principles, but not be an exhaustive list of, of all the things that that are elements of of concern or should be concerned for for directors and, and for the the corporation. Uh, but what we tried to do was probably be a bit more explicit and up to date in some of the areas um, that per perhaps before were, were just implicit things like um, it would cover activities of a director a thing a director does uh, through social media for example which wasn't in the in the prior draft and also confirming that that the, um, to the extent uh, the, the, or at least the code covers things such as harassment, discriminatory behavior, or anything that's going to make the corporation subject to uh, embarrassment or ridicule. Um, you might have thought that was implicit before, but we just wanted to make it explicit. And we've also made some changes in the uh, the duties of directors. Uh, again, the, the, the directors always had a duty to act in accordance with the uh, legislation um, and, and fiduciary obligations. Um, which was, you know, act in the best interest of the corporation. And, and part of that is uh, been added to its section 1.8, which is the duty to disclose information. Um, that may not have been fully understood before, but direct <clears throat> directors have an obligation to disclose information, which is uh, important to the interests of the corporation. And so we just we just wanted to make sure that that was on the record as well. Um, uh, so that's that's it sort of for the director's uh, documents as it were. And then the other three in front of us are the mandates. And I guess I'd say in, in general, <clears throat> what we've tried, uh, the uh, previously we had a, a committee directive and a, and a mandate for each of the committees. And we received a number of comments that people found that confusing to have two different documents and having to flip back and forth to you know how you call a meeting versus what what the mandate was. So we we put it together into one. So um, it, the document itself looks substantially different, but in fact, the front end of the document is now just more or less what was in the directive before. Um, we again we tried to reflect best practices, and, and Barry and his colleagues were instrumental in this. Um, you know, such as create uh, obligations, such as create a work plan, uh, annual review of the mandate, some of the roles and obligations of the chair of the committee. Um, we, we've also worked with uh, uh, staff and, and the committee themselves to, to make sure that, that we're highlighting the right objectives and we've identified the right objectives and, and practices and procedures of the committee. Uh, and we of each committee, and we've also tried to maintain consistency amongst the committees. The, the previously there was differences in way some some of the same concepts were were described, and so we've we've tried to maintain things as a in a consistent fashion. Um, dealing with some of the specifics of the committees for for farm, um, what we've uh, tried to do is highlight the areas of responsibilities and also provide uh, details. Um, we've clarified that insurance falls within the uh, ambit of this committee. That was one of the comments we received. 
<clears throat> we've uh, added fundraising as one of the areas of responsibility for farm and uh, we've provided some further details on on the actual obligations uh, of the committee um, you know areas such as risk management project management etc for this committee um, I think we've clarified the roles um, we've you know it still covers some of the same general areas such as HR which is looking at uh, compensation structure and principles uh, assisting with the evaluation of the CEO on an annual basis. Um, it still deals with board governance and effectiveness, um, which would include this process, such as in, uh, reviewing uh, uh, mandates and, and uh, governance documents. Uh, it would also include the uh, board evaluation, which we talk about in, in, as the next item of business. Um, stakeholder relations, uh, notwithstanding the name of the committee, the, the, the previous mandate or the current mandate didn't uh, contain a description as to, to what that entailed, so we, we've added language there. Uh, and then we've also added the uh, diversity uh, component uh, to the role of this committee. For IREC, um, you may recall that what we, we actually approved a revised form of mandate uh, last June. Um, so it is it, it, the changes there are perhaps less dramatic um, than, than than HR, for example. Uh, but we have changed certainly the change the formatting, as I say, uh, in the general, and also tried to streamline some of the processes and procedures uh, of IREC. Um, and for example, put in a definition of of, of major projects, uh, which was lacking before. And I think that was one. Of, I mean, I know that was one of the comments that that came out of the the process a year ago. Um, so that's sort of in a nutshell what we're talking about in terms of our six documents. Um, uh, Barry Writer's on the phone. I'm not sure if he wants to add anything right now or, or um, Wendy, maybe I'll, I'll turn it back to you and you can decide the best way to proceed, uh, whether that's getting comments from Barry or just opening up for discussions. Thank you, Ian. And uh, so as Ian has indicated, um, we'd like to recommend for approval by the board the six documents that have been distributed to the meeting um, and the materials in the form of the resolution are in your board book. But before I call for a resolution, um, we'd like to open it up for any further questions for Ian or Barry Ryder or any member of the senior management committee that's here. Um, I'd also like to remind the committee members that dir directors will have an opportunity to review the documentation further before consideration by the full board at our meeting on March 25th. Um, so why don't we open it up for questions and then we can have vote for um, a motion to recommend for approval. So moved. I think Patrick, I see both Patrick and Steve had their hands up. Okay, so Patrick. Uh, yeah, I just uh, wanted to, um, the um, better, you know, better definition of the ESG element um, across the committees. Uh, I, I think George spoke to that uh, offline uh, at, at one point, so I just wanted to um, kind of get that on the record. And then uh, I would ask that the management take a look at the procurement element and just uh, establish if that needs to be more explicit within the farm uh, charter, just as regards not to um, outliers, but more the the process and the oversight and the uh, uh, from from that particular risk element. That's uh, my two suggestions. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Patrick, could you reiterate um, what you were saying about ESG just quickly? Because I think well, it's, it's just that it seems it, it, it seems to sprinkle itself in some degree across uh, committees, but um, I just wouldn't want anything to fall within the the between um, between the chairs, as it were, uh, simply because it's becoming a larger and larger um, area for our um, well societally, but also for our government uh, partners. So I, I just would want to be sure that we're um, whatever committee is responsible for whatever elements, it's more it's it's more clearly defined. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. 
Yeah. Wendy, I can just say we are looking at that because the environmental sustainability and climate change agenda hits every one of our committees. So we'll take a look at, um, yeah. you know, w whether we can put a bit of a preamble or some some reference that it does cross all the committees. Yeah, I think I think Patrick makes a good point because it is embedded in everything we'll be doing. And so that's just sort of having having some language that includes it in, in an appropriate way. That sounds great. So, Steve, can we hear from you? Um, yeah, um, first of all, um, a lot of hard work and I've reviewed uh, a couple of documents as well that uh, I thought were important. Um, I may raise this um, uh, in camera at, at the next board meeting. Uh, but while a number of board members are on, I, I think there's two uh, important principles that the board needs to understand um, coming forward out of this. One has been there for a while, but there's uh, one that's uh, somewhat added on uh, in the code of conduct. Um, the first is that as a board member, um, you're supposed to look after the um, corporation as a whole and your duty isn't to the government that appointed you, your duty is to the objectives uh, of, of the Waterfront Corporation and you're intended to be an independent director. Um, and the other one is that, um, and, and Patrick, uh, this would apply, I think particularly to you and probably uh, Chris, um, it, it's become apparent uh, because of some issues that arose uh, in the last couple of months with respect to other work that the province is doing or infrastructure Ontario is doing that if you sit on another board um, that if anything comes to your attention that in um, even the vaguest way could affect the business of Waterfront Toronto uh, even if it's confidential in the infrastructure Ontario board you have a duty to disclose it um, to Waterfront Toronto um, regardless of the confidentiality because it could impact on our business. And I just want to raise that because it's something that's um, important and very delicate uh, when we have people uh, dealing with with a, um, uh, a number of boards. And so I just wanted to um, to make that clear. Um, so um, uh, and it is it is included in the um, in the codes of conduct. So I just wanted to add that so everybody is aware of those two uh, important obligations uh, moving forward. Those are my uh, only only good comments. Patrick, thank you, Steve. Patrick. Yeah, um, I, I think as regards that uh, that element, there is um, an understanding and expectation that uh, management and uh, other um, uh, there, there are other meetings with between between management uh, of the different agencies that should allow some level of uh, insight and so forth. So certainly uh, an area that I, I would want to have. Uh, I thought we had sort of rules of engagement around, but I'd certainly uh, uh, welcome uh, clarifying some of the uh, some of the channels of, uh, of discussion so that uh, we know what we can all expect from one another. So um, we'll, we can uh, sit down and um, discuss that, but I, I certainly think that there's a, a level of uh, regularity as to meetings between CEOs and uh, the agencies themselves. So um, assumption is that, uh, that there is a discussion at that level. So we can um, follow up with that. I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Thanks. Wendy, as, as Steve said, we can have further discussion when we're in closed session at our next board meeting uh, so that good. we can go through this in more detail. <clears throat> Very good. Okay, any other questions for Barry or Ian? Okay, then may I please have a motion to recommend for approval the three committee mandates, the code of conduct, the confidentiality agreement, and the indemnity agreement. Is there a mover? So moved. And I will second. And any discussion? All in favor? Contrary minded? Okay, so moved. Okay, thank you. So now we are going to item 
Now we're going to number eight. Is that correct? Um, um, just five. briefly, we should touch on number five, Wendy. Oh, oh sorry. Okay. No, no, no. Here I am bouncing. Sorry, I'm bouncing yeah, no, it's, a it's... little bit on this agenda. Okay. So item number five. The board evaluation overview. Um, so as, as part of our go governance process, we also intended to conduct a board evaluation and there's a cover note in the materials for the meeting and I'd ask Ian to just briefly review this matter. Sure, thanks very much. And this is very brief. Uh, it's for information only. Um, we are currently, uh, well, first of all, I, I think consistent with best practices, uh, as we say in our cover note, uh, that we should be um, surveying uh, the board, talking to the board members, evaluating the board, uh, and it's part of this, the mandate of this committee, uh, just to identify, you know, opportunities to improve, uh, identify existing strengths and, and I guess existing weaknesses and, and gaps. Um, and uh, so what we're doing is we're putting together a uh, an evaluation form and also uh, some methodology to uh, to come back to this committee, uh, hopefully the next for the next meeting. Certainly, we, we want to do that in in this year. Uh, I think it's best that we do it after we have new board members uh, come on board. Um, and uh, as I say, we're just looking at the uh, various alternatives and the, and the best way to to deal with this. Georgia, we've been talking before. I don't know whether you wanted to add anything or whether that was sufficient. Uh, no, I think that's sufficient. We're just looking at tools that uh, may be embedded in, in different programs that would allow us to do this in a cost effective way. And as Ian said, we'll be back uh, at the next meeting, give you recommendations. OK, thank you. so thank you, Ian and George. And so now we'll move on to item number eight, which is the update on tri-government strategic review. Um, uh, um, front Toronto um, mandate. Yes. Madam Chair, hi, Wendy, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Um, I reported on reputational reporting under 7B when uh, we really had 7A, which is social media performance. So if we'd like to go to this and come back. That's fine, social... thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Please go forward, Cameron. Thank you and apologies, I, I, I messed up the, er uh, the order, but um, we did want to um, spend just a couple of moments because I mentioned this at uh, a couple of other Board meeting, uh, board meetings about our social media followers and channels. So we just wanted to take a moment to um, to show directors how we uh, have been taking events and and matching them with audiences and the passions of audiences and aligning um, aligning stories and creating stories about how our mandate matters um, and telling these stories in our own voice. And so we wanted to show you a bit of that secret sauce or the art and the science of it because um, I think we've done a uh, we're really upping our game and we're con we're continuously improving and we're in this um, world of you know attention spans that are right now eight seconds long and so we're I think we're being really competitive um, for uh, mind share and eyeballs um, and so wanted to um, have two of my colleagues um, Mira Schenker who's a senior manager and she's been running the Portland's communications program uh, for the last uh, number of years and it's a tremendous asset to the corporation as well as uh, Michaela Compre, who's our who's a specialist, and she's a very important person to us because she's our kind of chief content marketer. And we wanted to share a couple of slides about how we are performing online and how we, um, again, how we tell stories online. So, Michaela, if you would. Sure. Thanks, Ken. You might have to speak up, Michaela. It's hard to hear. Oh, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Um. So thank you. Um, if we can go to the next slide, I'll start with just a quick overview of who's following us. We have almost 50,000 followers across the four major platforms, um, and this number is growing every day. Uh, in terms of demographics, we have close to an even split between men and women, and most of our followers are between 24 and 44 years old. Now Facebook skews a little bit older and Instagram skews a little bit younger. And uh, we're mainly reaching people in Toronto, the GTA, and to some extent uh, more broadly in Canada. The next slide, please. So this slide is showing how our social media content performs compared to similar organizations. Uh, the engagement rate measures what percentage of people who see our content are engaging with us. 
So as you can see here, we're outperforming the benchmark for similar organizations, which is showing that we're doing a good job of engaging our audience. Next slide, please. So how are we doing this? Uh, we're posting visually enticing photos as well as bite-sized information about our projects that drives traffic to our blog and our websites and our project websites. Uh, our followers share the content that they like, and then their followers and friends are exposed to our content too. We use this to promote project updates, public meetings, surveys, events, and opportunities to engage with, uh, engage with us both on and offline. And sometimes this results in earned media coverage. The next slide, please. So our Bridge Watch TO campaign was a great example of how a successful social campaign can get a lot of awareness and earn media. Uh, it was very successful both in terms of the number of people who engaged with us, but also in terms of the number of people who shared and saw our posts. This is really valuable as it also improves our brand recognition. Uh, the wide sharing of the content also contributed to our media coverage. Uh, over the period of this campaign, there are about 19 articles about the bridge, many of which lifted right out of our social campaign. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, part of what made this campaign so strong is that the different elements of the bridge's journey got different levels of attention on different platforms, which helped to keep up the interest in the campaign. And that's a lesson that we're using going forward. Next slide, please. Thanks. I'm, so we're always uh, looking to improve. We're doing quarterly analysis of our performance. Um, and these are some of the things that we've noted from that analysis. We're posting more consistently, um, as well as reflecting on our past successes and ongoing projects, which helps to keep people really engaged and excited about the work that we're doing. We're tailoring our content to the specific audiences on each platform based on our analysis of what's done well in the past. Uh, so for example, this is short video clips on Twitter, longer videos on other platforms, and multi-image posts on Instagram. We're also posting strong content on Twitter uh, two to three times over a few weeks to help us reach more people. And lastly, our analysis is showing that video content is performing especially well. Um, and we also get a lot of insightful questions and comments on YouTube. So we're looking at ways to use YouTube more effectively uh, through things like inviting comments or suggesting the next video to view as well as looking to create more uh, shorter and promotional style videos uh, that really engage our audience and creates more brand advocates for us. That's our, our quick overview, if there are any questions. Thank you, Michaela. It's really interesting to see this. I just, uh, I find it very interesting. And any questions for Michaela and Cameron? Hey, it, Wendy, it's Andrew. I would just say relative to the strategy, I think it makes a lot of sense. I spent a lot of time in this world myself. To the extent that you can utilize the sort of larger platforms to, you know, engender discovery and then sort of herd the traffic back to an organic site that, that you guys manage, that will be cost effective uh, over time. So, so obviously it's, you know, it's lucrative at the beginning relative to the audience engagement, but ultimately the economics invert and you have to pay more and more to get the same traffic. So anyway, it's just a philosophical point to the extent that you can drive that traffic back to a site you know, on your site and then, you know, create that engagement and additional discovery. That's a that's a good sort of strategic philosophy in the mid to long term. Mm, absolutely. Can I ask a quick follow up question, actually, Andrew, if you don't mind? Sure. Um, so we do mostly drive people to our corporate blog or to the two project sites, Keyside and Portland's flood protection that we've built. Um, the main way that people get to our blog is via social. So very few people, I, um, based on our analysis, are navigating um, straight to the blog. They're going, you know, from our Twitter or from our Instagram over to that. Um, and so, um, it, are you suggesting that there might be a way to kind of ultimately drive people directly to those properties, kind of keeping them there and having return, circumventing the social or? Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily circumventing. The, I mean, the power of those platforms is obvious. There's a reason why they're as dominant as they are. I just think it's a combination of, you know, sometimes it's SEO, creating better discovery where if people are going to do a search on Waterfront, which may not always be the case, but that might change over time, especially as the RFP is released and interest lifts sort of organically across Toronto and other jurisdictions. And then I think the other sort of lens is utilizing those sites for discovery. And then once the traffic gets funneled back to whatever, whatever the sort of organic site that you're maintaining. You mentioned the blog and, and and the two waterfront sites, but just making it easy to navigate and have people stay there, right? So additional discovery points or links or you know follow on to the next video, sort of creating that same sort of I don't know what the right word is, but like algorithmic 
sort of automated discovery. So people stay and want to learn more. It just oh, for it, sure. it keeps so them there and you're not paying over and over again for the same traffic. So it's just so a- That's yeah. a, a whole other presentation. We actually also do a whole bunch of website analytics looking at just that, right? So visitor flow, stickiness, how many pages do they navigate to once they land? And, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, it's tougher on some websites than others, but we do also try to kind of do exactly that, keep people there once they're there. Great, terrific. And I think we've got another question. I think that's me. I I believe the website's being uh, updated, uh, I believe, towards the end of the year. And I just wanted to understand how that fit into uh, the rest of all of this, um, just for um, simplicity. Yeah, I'll, I'll, Patrick, it's Cameron. Um, you're correct. We are rebuilding the, the Waterfront Toronto corporate website. And as we've alluded to, we have two kind of satellite um, websites that support Portland's and and Keyside, and those are creatures of necessity because the functionality of the corporate website was getting long in the tooth. Couldn't support that, so we're going right through with our vendor right now through that user experience. Um, and I'm like I'm liking this discussion we just had about the rabbit holes, how we can create more rabbit holes so people stick around longer. But we are. Uh, we developed some personas about people who use our website and how how we can best improve their uh, their uh, ex experience and the existing site doesn't play particularly well with social um you know it was built at a time when people would come to websites directly and now social allows us to go to where people are and then drag them back um so it's going to be a it's going to be a significant uh rebuild and it, it will significantly improve the the, the, uh, the user experiences uh, based on the personas that we've developed about who, who uses the site. So it's going to be a fundamental rebuild. Thanks. And any more questions for Cameron or Michaela or Mira? Well, I just I just like to say very good work, and I think. The, you know, the short videos are very powerful and um, whenever there's an aerial video of the Portland's project and I just take a clip of it and send it out, um, there's tremendous response, so positive. So this is really good work. And, and Cameron, if we can hear from you and your team in these meetings, I think it's very helpful. And it's great to have you, Andrew, as your, with your expertise um, weigh in here too. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Um, okay, so shall we move on to the Tri-Government Strategic Review? N item number eight. Hi, um, it's Ed Chalupka. Um, I very quickly just wanted to update you on the Strategic Review. As you know, the three years of government are undertaking a Strategic Review of Waterfront Toronto. Uh, the purpose of the review really is to update the findings of the Strategic Review that was undertaken in 2015 KPMG has been retained by elders of government to do so. Um, and uh, just to remind people in terms of the 2015 review, it was fairly positive for Waterfront Toronto. It identified that we were delivering on our mandate in an effective uh, and efficient manner and that uh, we were the appropriate organization to lead water, waterfront revitalization going forward. Um, so governments are updating, or I should say KPMG is updating that and they're doing so with uh, primarily through uh, interviews with stakeholders from the seniors of government, senior management, I should say, uh, from all orders of government uh, have been interviewed along with the C-suite from Waterfront Toronto, uh, George, obviously, and committee chairs from uh, Waterfront Toronto, as well as the chair. Those took place in uh, December of this year. Um, KPMG is also looking externally to development partners uh, of Waterfront Toronto and others uh, to help inform that study. Um, so think of the street review, review in sort of two parts. You've got the KPMG update of the of the report from 2015, and concurrently, governments are having conversations. Uh, that report will inform the conversations that are having or that governments are having. Um, they're looking at obviously our strengths and our weaknesses. They're looking at the financial sustainability of Waterfront Toronto um, post 2024. Obviously, Portland's flood protection funding. Um, uh, ends, and so how does Waterfront Toronto uh, how do they address that issue, especially if um, governments uh, who are examining our mandate, there's a obviously a mandatory wind up of Waterfront Toronto in 2028 as part of our legislation. Governments are obviously considering an extension to that mandate. 
uh, and ensuring uh, how, how to uh, address our financial sustainability, as I said, as part of that, and ensuring that our projects and uh, priorities that we've outlined are, are appropriate. Um, uh, as well, governments are uh, discussing about discussing how to, in fact, uh, work well together. How are they working well together? Uh, and with Waterfront Toronto to uh, uh, ensure that we're delivering on waterfront revitalization efficiently. So, in terms of timelines, KPMG uh, will finalize its report by the end of this month, and uh, we'll take those recommendations to the Intergovernmental Steering Committee in mid-April, I believe April 15th. Um, with a view to uh, the City of Toronto taking uh, its recommendations and a staff report to the committee as well as the City Council cycle in June. I believe June 8th is the, uh, the Council date. Uh, and so uh, with that, I open it up to any questions that um, the committee might have. Thank you, Ed. Very helpful to have a sense of the timeline because I know that um, we were the committee um, chairs um, and, of course, senior management were involved in in the meetings in December, and those were very interesting sessions. Um, and it looks like we have a question here too. I'm sorry, I I end up not knowing who's asking the question, so I'm just going to. I just see a hand. Is that it's you, Steve. Matt? It's no, Steve, I think it's Steve. Steve. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. Steve, please go forward. No, Thanks, I just, Steve. Um, I, I just, uh, I may have missed it, but um, I know when that, well, when will we find out, like, do we get any advance notice of, you know, June's around the corner when, what the recommendations are going to say, or is it just all come out at the same time? No, Steve, we'll, we'll, we'll get a, obviously, uh, an advance peak of that. Uh, the IGSC will, uh, is meeting in mid-April. Um, George sits on the IGSC, uh, okay. and so we participate as part of that. And and we are working closely with the City of Toronto, the, the province, and the feds uh, as we move forward with KPMG. There have been several workshops um, among all parties uh, addressing a lot of these issues in terms of visions, priorities, government coordination, financial sustainability, and roles and responsibilities uh, moving forward on the waterfront. So those are all sort of themes and topics that we've uh, we've. Uh, been engaged in with governments and we have a good sense. I mean, the, the preliminary findings, uh, without getting into too much detail in sort of the public session, the preliminary findings uh, from KPMG have been fairly positive, um, but uh, uh, we, we, we will have a good sense certainly by April. Okay, thank you. So, so Steve, just to add to that, um, as Ed said, the preliminary findings um, by KPMG and also at the staff level are very supportive um, of Waterfront Toronto. Still have to work out the details. Chris Murray and I are um, directed to take charge to uh, better define roles and responsibilities going forward, and then we'll have to work out the funding and financing. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Ed. Um, do we have any further questions for Ed? Okay, so then let's move on to item number nine on our agenda, which is the motion to go into closed session. So may I please have a motion to go into closed session to discuss items 10 and 11 of today's agenda. And I just want to remind everyone that any resolution considered in the closed session also needs to be passed when the meeting returns to the open session. Um, is there a mover, please? So moved. And I will second. Um, all in favor? We're back in the public session and we're on item number 14, which is the um, resolution arising from the closed session. Um, and so may I please have a motion to approve the November 12th, 2020 committee meeting closed session minutes. Is there a mover? So moved. And I will second. Any discussion? All in favor, contrary minded. Okay, so so moved. Okay, so now we'll have a motion to terminate the meeting. Thank you, Andrew, for staying on and being your for your support today. Absolutely. Our very small committee. And thank you, Patrick. It's always great to have you here as well. Uh, thanks for having me. I always feel welcome. So uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Okay, so the meeting's terminated. Thanks everyone for their participation. Stay healthy and safe and speak to you at our next board meeting. Thanks everyone. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you, guys. everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.